I hear your hollow laughter, your sighs of secret pain, pretending and inventing. Just to hide your shame. Plastic smiles and faces, blinking back the tears. Good morning. My name is Stephen Capaldo from Echad Unity Ministries in North Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you're having a good day. It's uh, September 1st, Tuesday, September 1st. I don't know where the summer went. We still have the summer weather, but uh, the summer has uh, has gone away pretty pretty quickly. Time seems to pass more and more quickly. So I hope you're doing well. Uh, before we begin, I would just like to pray to you, Father, and thank you for another day and uh, bringing us together, and uh, uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity to uh, bring forth a message, and we ask that it will be an edification to those who will hear it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And uh, before we begin, I would also just like to uh, speak a word of blessing over all, all pastors and all people who, who labor uh, in the Word of God for what they do, uh, people I've known, people I've not known, uh, because the, the work is difficult. If you do it the way that God wants you to do it, it's not going to be an easy life, so I would just like to, uh, to, to pray for all those, uh, all those people who do that work and uh, ask for blessings for them. And I'll give you uh, John 3.16 in the different uh, languages. Sepse peronzia e deshi aç bütün sağda birine ti tie vetsem injurim che kushto che bison yetie te masumbase portie ke te yetie te periechne For God so loved the world he gave his uniquely born son so that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life I bo tak was lubil bok mir što otul syna svojego jedinorodnego da by vsyaki virishi v nego ni pagib no imel jizn vetsne Infatti Dio ha talmente amato il mondo da dare il suo figliuolo unigenito, affinché chiunque crede in lui non perisca ma abbia la vita eterna. Perché di tal maniera amò Dio al mondo che Dio ha suo figlio unigenito, perché tutto a quel che crede in lui non perisca ma stenga vita eterna. Car Dieu a tant aimé le monde qu'il a donné son fils unique afin que quiconque croit en lui ne périsse pas ma qu'il ait la vie éternelle. So, with all of that, we'll begin, and today what I have is, uh, I have two, two different um, passages that speak to the idea of obedience to God, and it's interesting, one of them is from Ecclesiastes, and the other one is from John, and uh, one of them really, it's, uh, it's the story of Solomon, and there's been a lot uh, taught, and some, some very good things taught and written about that, uh, that the book of Ecclesiastes, and, and how Solomon, although he was a brilliant believer, uh, he got sidetracked. He got sidetracked by the things of the world. And he tried this and he tried that. He tried, you know, money and influence and relationships and uh, all, all kinds of things, academic work. You know, he tried all kinds of things and, and only to find out that really uh, the lesson to him was to, to fear God and keep his commandments. And then Jesus, before he went to the cross, when he was explaining uh, that he was going to send the, the Holy Spirit, said, uh, if you love me, obey my commandments. So basically both our commands are, 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 you know, Solomon is saying he learned from God that he should obey the commandments. Jesus is telling his disciples, just before he goes to the cross, if you love me, obey my command commandments. But in one case, Solomon says fear God and Jesus says love God. So I, I think that's kind of interesting. Do, do fear and love, uh, you know, in a spiritual sense, do they intersect? Do, is there something that's kind of common in between them? Because what's being, what's being asked is obedience in both cases. Uh, in the first case, obviously, uh, fear God and obey his commandments. Uh, in that case, that was in the day of Solomon, so that would have still been the Mosaic Law. And in the day uh, that Jesus said it, Obey my commandments, he was just getting ready to turn the page from law to grace. He hadn't gone to the cross yet, but he was going to go to the cross. And when he died and was buried, that was the end of the law, and the resurrection would be grace. And then eventually, uh, at Pentecost, the Spirit would come down. So, uh, the voice of God speaks differently to different, uh, to different generations. Uh, you know, in the time of Solomon, God is speaking one way, and then in the time of Jesus, he's speaking another way, and then Jesus is getting ready to, to, to make the switch, make the switch from the one system to another system, or from what, you know, one revelation to, to another revelation. Um, 
the law was necessary because it was it's what people wanted and it was necessary to show people uh, about sin you know and the impact of sin and what it is the effect that it has on your life uh, so pe people rejected the love covenants with, that God had with Abraham which really was much more of a love and grace covenant they rejected that they wanted something else and then uh, a the Abrahamic covenant was supposed to, supposed to be the connection with Christ so that uh, uh, but there was this period of the law that you know before Christ could come and then we could eventually have grace but we'll just start with Ecclesiastes 12 uh, chapter 12 which is the conclusion you know Solomon has lived this life and he's 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 tried to have uh, the things of the world and he's just found that you know the, you know the famous uh, scripture of you know vanity of vanities of all is vanity he's found that all of these things that are not the things of god you know they give limited pleasure it's not that they don't give any pleasure but they give limited pleasure they give temporary pleasure but in the end having a real relationship with god is the key to uh to uh, happiness and he says in chapter 12 don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator and this is what we all get, especially when we're young, we get distracted by different things. And we have different feelings and different emotions. And, you know, maybe we make bad decisions about uh, in certain areas of life. Um, honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. And that's something, you know, we, we, we can all uh, wish that. But, I mean, really, if you look at yourself as uh, eternal, that, you know, God, uh, God uh, created you or the idea of you and that, that idea has always existed in his mind you know that's to create you for you to come forth in, in the world and then to go on to eternal life that was his his plan for you you can consider yourself old on planet earth but really you're you're young in your spiritual life because you're going to go on forever if you had faith in the lord jesus christ so your youth can be you know you can be 20 years old or it can be it can be the the, the spiritual youth of when you're 80 you know knowing that you're going to go on forever Remember him before the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes, and rain clouds continually darken your sky. So never forget, never forget the role of God in your life. And the sun and the moon and the stars, now certain people have uh, said uh, these really represent uh, different uh, persons of the Trinity, and well, that's, that's possible, you can take it that way. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is to put God first in your life, that's really the basic lesson here. Remember him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble. So before the, before the body goes south, you know, before you get old and you don't see so well and you don't walk so well, you know, don't, don't wait. Today is the day for salvation, right? Today is the day to believe. If you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, today is the day. Don't, don't wait. And even, even in the Old Testament, you know, a different generation and a different revelation, you know, Solomon is, is trying to prepare people for that. That he's, he's telling you that here was, he, he was a famous and a, a brilliant man and a believer, you know, who knew, who knew the word of God that says it was revealed to him. And he kind of frittered away his life in all of these superficial human activities and it's not that God has anything against you enjoying life but he really wants you to give give yourself you know surrender your life to him and then he will he, he will take care of the needs that you have in this earth you know if you, you need a place to stay you need food to eat you need some employment you need whatever you need he takes care of those needs and takes care of them very well and you can enjoy life in that respect if you've surrendered your life first you know to, to uh, uh, God by faith in Jesus Christ and before your shoulders, the strong men stoop. Remember him. Remember God before your teeth, your few remaining servants. That's a nice little sense of humor there, right? Stop grinding. And before your eyes, the women looking through the windows see dimly. So, uh, in other words, uh, you, you ain't all that. You get to a certain age and physically, you know, things, things are different, you know. But so don't, you know, don't wait till then to come to the Lord. You know, come to the Lord, you know, today. Today is the appropriate day. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. And that's when he means that, you know, you can be a believer, you can have believed in Jesus Christ and you totally miss your calling. You know, you just, uh, you kind of, you, you turn away or you just, you know, you, maybe you, uh, you know, produce a little bit of fruit here and there. I mean, you are saved and you go to heaven, but, you know, you can just, uh, you, you can totally miss your calling. God is saying it's very important not only to be saved by faith, uh, not only to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is important for the rest of your time on planet Earth to live in the calling that he has because he, ha he made you in his image, so he must, he, he must want you to come to him 
and he must want you to do something, you know, once you've come to him. So don't miss out on that calling, and that's, I think that's kind of the tragedy of a lot of, uh, a lot of the Christian faith nowadays, is that people just kind of miss out on the calling because they, they go back to all of the uh, distractions and, you know, the hectic lifestyles that we live, and they, they really miss what God has for them, even though they kind of, you know, they, they, they understood that they needed God, but then they kind of, in everyday life, they kind of forget about him, or they only kind of, they're, they're in and out, you know, they're occasionally on the narrow path, and occasionally on the broad path, occasionally they're bearing some fruit, occasionally they're bearing no fruit or bad fruit, and it's just kind of a, it's kind of a schizophrenic existence for a lot of Christians. And, and God doesn't want that, he wants you to be steady and consistent, and, you know, always on the path of truth. Remember him before the door to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first chirping of the birds, but then all their sounds will grow faint. So see, your senses are starting to dull as you get older. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets. Before your hair turns white, that's a little late for some of us, like an almond tree in bloom and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper. And the caperberry no longer inspires sexual desire. So I guess it was caper berries in those days. Today they talk about things like, you know, avocado and oysters and peanut butter and stuff like that. But uh, so, so he's, he's really, this, it's, it's, very, it's humorous. You know, I said, you know, we, we die, we have this physical body that is supposed to die uh, because we move on to heaven. We move on to that other dimension. But you can really have the fullness of life if you have faith, you know, early in life. You know, so don't don't let that go. Don't don't ignore that. Don't don't dissipate. You know, don't just kind of waste your time. You know, on these uh, earthly things when you can have the things of God from from a very early age, from the, the age when you first uh, uh, you know you first know who God really is, uh, Jesus Christ. Yes, remember your Creator now while you're young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Uh, so until your, your body just, uh, just disappears, your body fades away. The body decays, and uh, there's really nothing we can do about that. We can, if, we, if we live a healthy life uh, physically the best way we can, we can kind of stabilize our health for the number of days that God has for us. But he does have a certain number of days for us, and it's different for everyone. But uh, whatever that number of days is, you want your health to be your physical health to be stabilized so you can you can enjoy the environment around you and you can truly serve the Lord in the capacity that he's called you to serve whatever the calling he has for your life is and then Solomon really gets to his conclusion don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well for then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it everything is meaningless says the teacher completely meaningless keep this in mind the teacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. The teacher sought to find just the right words to express truths clearly. The words of the wise are like cattle prods, painful but helpful. Their collected sayings are like a nail-studded stick with which a shepherd drives uh, the sheep. So you have to have that correction. You know, the, the word of God is, is uh, it's, uh, it's all... Uh, spirits breathed uh, and inspired and it's good for correction and reproof and, and teaching and, and study. So it's important to have that correction, it's important to have the wisdom of the teacher, whoever the teacher is, and you might have different teachers. I mean ultimately the teacher for us now is the, the indwelling Holy Spirit, you know, if you're a born again believer. That's that's really your teacher. And then, you know, the spirit can work, you know, to bring you into different environments where you get exposed to, uh, you know, other sources of teaching, but it's all under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads this. But my child, let me give you some further advice. <clears throat> Be careful, for writing books is endless, and much study wears you out. So he even comes with that conclusion, that even trying to, to, to write about wisdom and teach people, and, and, and even to get them into the things of God. I mean, you can do too much of anything, and, and just, um, you can, the, so sometimes you make an idol out of the very thing that you do. I mean, even if you write books about God, sometimes the writing of the book becomes the, 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 the thing, and it becomes the idol instead of, you know, what effect or what impact the writing of the book could have. You just get kind of caught away or, or caught up in the writing of the book. It becomes the idol in and of itself. And he's telling you, no, don't make anything into an idol. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. I've gone through all of this. Fear God and obey his commands. 
for this is everyone's duty. So whatever it is, the calling on your life, whatever it is, the laws of the land, you know, uh, fear God and obey his commands. Now, fear, and then Jesus is going to say, love, if you love me, you obey my commands. So that's the interesting thing. Where do fear and love intersect? You know, where are they the same thing? Because we think of fear being afraid, being intimidated, being terrified, and we think of love as being very soft and kind and compassionate. And yet, on the matter of obedience, we're told in Scripture both to fear in one place and to love uh, in order to obey in another place. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. So nobody gets away with, any, with anything, every secret thing. God knows all, since he does know all, he knows everything that we're up to. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he, he knows if we've been bad or good, right? So. So be good for goodness sakes. I mean, he's not Santa Claus, but he's, you know, he's, God knows, God knows. So we think we get away with things, but really, nobody really does get away with, with anything. And, and that's, a, that's a very good thing to remember if you go through trials and you think that you're being unjustly treated by someone and, you know, life isn't fair and this and that. Uh, it's, it's, it's good to remember that, you know, you're not the judge here and the one who is the judge sees everything. and. It, it, it all it all comes out in the end, you know. God allows certain things, and he, he he's he's the ultimate judge of everything, you know, Jesus Christ. And uh, so, what, whatever you're going through, I, I I hope that I can give you a word of encouragement that you, you don't need to um, you don't need to worry that someone is getting away with something. I mean, they're getting away with something in a very limited way, in the you know on planet Earth in the natural realm, but in the spirit realm. God knows everything that's happening, and we don't really get away with anything. All of us, we all do things that fall short of the mark. And, you know, some people maybe do it a little bit more, some people maybe do it a little bit less. Some people are much more intense about doing bad things than others, you know. I mean, that's everybody's different, but we all fall short of the mark. And nobody gets away with anything. That's a very important thing to learn. And then the other uh, passage that I wanted to look at is chapter 14, when... Uh, you know, Jesus is explaining uh, to, to his uh, people that the, the Holy Spirit is going to come. And he starts, don't let your hearts be troubled. So, uh, in other words, the, the, the worry, the fear, the anxiety, the fe fear in the sense of being afraid of something. You know, a different meaning, kind of the more traditional meaning of fear. You know, don't, don't do that. Don't be afraid of a situation. Go right at it with the Word of God. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. Trust in God the Father and trust also in me, Son of God. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you. The second coming, I'll come back for you, so that you will always be with me where I am and you know the way to where I'm going. Or it could be, there could be two uh, events here. God, uh, Jesus Christ returns for his saints, and then he returns with his saints. And we, we uh, <clears throat> in the, the uh, most of the teaching and the scripture, you know, we have uh, the, 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 the terms, the events are called the rapture and the second coming. The second coming is more of a scriptural term. The rapture is, is not a word that's used, but that's Christ coming for the saints. And then he returns with the saints, and there's a certain amount of time in between those two events, which only the Father knows what, what that time is. But uh, he's preparing a place for us. So he's, he's coming back. He's getting ready to come back for the thousand years to rule and reign with, with an iron fist. So, you know, he's going to have expectations of, you know, how, how we behave and uh, how we follow, you know, whatever, whatever his commandments will be at that time. And they may be different. If you, if, you, if you believe that God speaks with a different voice to different generations, then don't expect that the next, the, the next revelation, the thousand years, that the conditions are going to be exactly the same as they were in this, in, in this revelation, because in this revelation of grace, they're certainly very different than they were in the last revelation, which was the law. And you keep going back like that. You've got these seven distinct revelations, uh, you know, to show that God spoke a different way. God never changes, but he speaks a different way to every generation. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said, and, and you know the way to where I'm going, uh, Jesus says. And then Thomas says, no, we don't know, Lord. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Well, Jesus told him, I am the way. You know, it's not knowing it's not knowing the way or getting knowledge about the way. I am the way. I'm the way to the Father who is spirit. I'm the Son of God, Messiah. I'm the I am the way. The truth, the word of God, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you'd really known me, 
you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Because the Father and the Son are one, right? They've had, that's, that, that's how Jesus lived a sinless life, is that he had this eternal bond of unity um, that, that kept him uh, sinless, allowed him to live a sinless life. It took him through all of the, uh, all, all of the uh, evil, wicked situations that he had to confront uh, on this planet, which for him is like, uh, it's like a cesspool. And, I've, and, and there was some, some uh, uh, teaching, you know, that, that, uh, that I heard that I, I thought was quite funny, but it was a pretty good analogy, that uh, the idea of the Son of God coming down to earth, it's kind of like the idea of, uh, of a human being becoming a cockroach. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's voluntarily taking on yourself, uh, onto yourself something that is totally you know, totally less than you. I mean, it's uh, uh, the idea that God would become a man. It's you know, like man becoming something much less. And I, I always thought that was kind of funny teaching, and uh, but a, but a very a very good analogy. Philip said, "Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied." So he's almost like being the he's being the doubting Philip. You know, show us the Father, and you know we'll we'll know you know well we don't see the Father, right? So show us the Father. Well, if you look at Jesus, that's it's the same thing. The Father and the Son are one, right? Jesus replied, "Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am?" So he's being a little stern here. You know, the, there's kind of the the, the many the many different. Uh, I won't say faces of Jesus, but the many different aspects of the teaching. You know, some of it uh, is is humorous, and some of it is tender, and some of it is, uh, is is a little bit stern. He's being stern here, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my Father, who lives in me, does his work through me. Just believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. So, this is the call to faith. And it's you know, a little bit of a stern uh, manner is that, you know, Jesus has set this example, uh, his whole ministry, and he's, he's, he's being, uh, I don't know if impatient is the right word, but he's saying, he's, he's making an assessment. You know, Philip, you really, you're a little slow on the uptake. I mean, you've seen all of this, and you still don't seem to get it. And he's not downright insulting him but he's just saying you know you're you're just you, you should have got this by now Why, what's what's wrong you're not really paying attention I tell you the truth anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done and even greater works even more works because I'm going to be with the father and you're going to be here and so you'll you will be able to uh, you know do more works in the spirit you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. Anything that's, uh, that, that is really in his name, which means in his will. Right? If you love me, Jesus says, obey my commandments. It's not <coughs> uh, fear God and obey his commandments. It's if you love me, obey my commandments. So what do they have in common? I think that the common thread of fear and love here is really it's kind of respect. Fear is awe and reverence, it's respect. So respect me and keep my commandments. And respect is part of love as well. So respect me and obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is getting ready to turn the page. The law isn't quite over yet. He hasn't gone to the cross. But he's explaining what's coming after the period of grace, starting with the resurrection. And then there will be the ascension. And then Pentecost, the Holy Spirit will come down. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. He lives with you now. He's with you, but later he will be in you when he comes down at Pentecost. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you also will live. When I'm raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them, and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. So he's talking about his death and his resurrection. The resurrection is really what makes, what, what makes the faith. I mean, if there's no resurrection power I mean it's just the rest of the, the the rest of the account you know of the Word of God just doesn't it, it doesn't make sense it's what it what makes the faith the faith it's what makes you know the, the the true Christian faith the true Christian faith and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them 
And there's just a few more verses, and we close. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name, said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. So he will be revealed. If you love him, he, he will be revealed. My Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them inside. That's uh, Pentecost. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I'm still with you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I've told you. So that's why we say that the, you know, the Holy Spirit is really the teacher now. Uh, everything else is kind, of, uh, uh, is kind of a branch from the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit is, is kind of the, the, the guardian of the Word of God and teaches you the Word of God. And through, you know, through other people and circumstances and believers and unbelievers and, 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 and to you directly when you study on your own, it's, the, it's that Holy, Holy Spirit that is really uh, showing you the Word of God, showing you the way, the truth, and the life that is, is Jesus Christ. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. Let not your hearts be troubled, is what he said at the start, right? And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you. I'm going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I'm going to the Father, who's greater than I am. I've told you these things before they happen, so that when they do happen, you will believe. The Father, who is greater than I am, you see the reverence that he has for the Father. Because really, the Father and Son are one, but see, the Son is being reverence, showing respect for his father. He's greater than I am. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches, and so that's that's part of the plan, is that you know he's, he's allowed to rule the world for a time. He has no power over me, but I will do what the Father requires of me, so that the world will know that I love the Father. Come, let's be going. So, do what the Father requires of you. Believe in the Son, obey the Spirit, and, and do it because of really respect, which is kind of the common thread of love and fear, but really obey the commandments. However God is speaking to your generation, those are your commandments. Obey them because you love God and you have, the, you have fear in the sense of awe and reverence and respect. So thank you again, Father, for this time, and uh, we ask that this message will be a blessing to those who will hear it, and we ask for the peace and prosperity of God to be with uh, all those listening. and. Uh, spread this message uh, to all those who desire to hear it and what we ask that you be with those who are uh, unsaved that you uh, show them you know what jesus christ has done for them and that you will help them uh, come to a knowledge of, of the the truth of salvation the truth of the cross and then the uh, the truth of of the way of life that uh, that you have for us uh, once we've believed in your son we thank you very much for everything you do for us father in jesus name we pray amen thank you for listening and thank you betsy